Are we rushed for time? Read only half all the poems you wrote. <laughs> all right. I, um, I do need to beg your indulgence for this one. I wanted to um, write something special for this weekend and for Labor Day, which I think is a holiday that we, we as a nation do not recognize and appreciate the way we should. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. But I also wanted to write something to honor my grandfather. And I especially wanted Ron and John and Sandra and Shelley to hear this for reasons that will be obvious. My grandfather was a high-ranking warrior in the fight for um, just establishing basic decent rights for the coal miners of America about a century ago. He sacrificed a lot, including a stint in prison um, for his activism. And he did some writing, and he wrote an article that I found in a, what I think is a communist trade magazine, called Labor Age. And I wrote a found poem from his article. It was very hard. Um, he was clearly at the end of his, his hope when he wrote this, and it was hard to, to find a poem to lift out of his words, but this is what I came up with, and these are my grandfather's words coming out of my mouth. They are not mine. The Ohio Miner After 40 Years, published May 1932. In 1891, there were about 250,000 miners in the coal industry. Of these, nearly 32,000 paid dues into the UMWA. In 1892, although it was a year of Great Depression and membership dropped again, the miners were granted the right to place a checkway man on the tipple to see that they were not robbed of the weight of the coal they mined, to see that they were not robbed. Yet conditions kept getting worse. And on April 10th, 1894, a convention was called by the remaining union miners, who now numbered only 13,000. These few sturdy members, however, decided to call a strike of all the miners of the country. About 125,000 answered the call in the course of the fight to establish the miners' union throughout the country. In Ohio, many miners were thrown into jail into jail. Their cases eventually fought and won in the courts by Major William McKinley, who was later to become president. In 1896, the average yearly wages for miners topped out at $319. $319 a year. The operators were getting the miners to leave the union. Membership dwindled. A convention was called in June. Many local unions couldn't pay the expenses of their delegates. Many stole their way on freight trains. Stole their way on freight trains. A strike call was issued for July 4. It was this strike that paved the way for the wonderful achievements of 98, when the miners were granted the eight-hour day an increase in wages, a closed shop agreement, and more. In 1914, after a long and bitter struggle, the miners in Ohio succeeded in establishing the mine run law, whereby they were paid for all coal mined and loaded, paid for their work. The conditions of the miners and their families became better. The Ohio Industrial Commission was created which provided that the working man should be compensated for the time lost because of accident. His dependents provided with funds to maintain and educate his children. Then, the operators claimed they could no longer compete if they continued to pay union wages. They pooled vast sums of money and imported unskilled workers from the South. Stupidity, or worse, had its way. 
Men who had built their homes and reared their families in these hills saw their all slipping away. Strangers were filling their places in the mines, moving into the villages, driving them to despair. Once they got the mines in operation again, the operators began slashing wages, breaking down the working conditions that had been won by all the years of struggle. They reestablished company stores. Two men are now forced to work in the space for one. State laws are being evaded. The custom of pulling the coal by beast has been discontinued and the men must push or pull the coal themselves. Falling backward, the outlook is not bright. Wow. Thank you. And those were the words that he ended his article with, the outlook is not bright. And I think it's safe to assume he had lost hope by that time. He would actually drink himself to death 15 years later. But I share his words today with hope. I think that we have seen from my grandfather and Reverend King reminds us that forward movement in social work is never a straight line. We always fall back and move forward again, back and forward again. And we've seen that lately. And I want to remind you all that poets have always been part of that forward movement, always throughout history and we always will be.